Dear Heavenly Father, we just surrender this moment to you and we lift our petitions. We thank you for your presence here with us this morning. This beautiful building that you've given us, a place that we can come and worship the name above all other names. How great is our God. Lord, you've been not good to us, you've been great. But more, if we had better words, you've been magnificent. You've been all that we need. And we just ask this morning as we meditate upon this word that you've given us, that it would draw us closer to you. Father, we just thank you and praise you. Abundantly we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, uh, please turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. We've been looking at these verses for the past three weeks, and again this fourth. Next week will be the fifth, and the last week that we consider these verses from Mark, chapter 12, verses 28. 31. One of the scribes came and heard them reasoning together. Perceiving that Jesus had answered them well, he asked them, Which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of this holy word. The last three weeks we have been considering this first and greatest commandment. And I hope that during this time... Your heart has been meditating upon whether we can love God more, which I believe we all can. There's more of ourselves that can be surrendered, more that we can offer. There's more of our heart that we can give, more of our mind. Today we'll discuss more of our soul. Next week, our strength. I pray that as we continue through this morning sermon, that you ask yourself, am I loving God with my whole soul? Recall when we began down this journey, we were discussing love. And if we are to love God in all of these ways, we must first understand what love is. We put forth that love is more than a thought. God could have sat upon His throne in his perfect righteousness and holiness and thought about man, how he loved him, and would have been perfectly justified in that regard. How good it is that God thinks about us. Have you ever considered that matter in your lives when you're going through a difficult time? Just the thought that God is thinking about me brings me a sense of divine consolation. But God did more than just think about us. His thought became an action because John says he loved so much that he gave us his only son. This action was a giving action. And this giving action manifested itself by the condensation of Jesus Christ. The incarnation of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. And his life was a life of constant giving. He gave to the sick by performing miracles. He gave to the hungry by multiplying the loaves and the fishes. He gave to the sinner by imparting to them forgiveness and salvation. And God Almighty continues to love man from His throne. And He continues to love man and give in all of these ways. Then we discussed what it means to love God with our heart. The anatomical heart receives the oxygen that is rich in our body and brings it to the rest of our body to nurture it. But it dispels the poor oxygen from our body through the lungs. And so is the operation of the Word of God on our lives. If we are to love God with our heart, we must love His Word. We must love the life of Christ. And we must allow it 
to cleanse us from sins and to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Last week we discussed loving God with our mind, part of which means to align ourselves and our opinions with the truth of the gospel. Remember we discussed the Pharisees and the scribes, Pilate, who put Jesus to death. They were wrestling with the truth. We discussed the Pharisees who allowed their religion to get in the way of them receiving and loving the truth with their mind. We talked about how the world also crept in as they aligned themselves with the political officials of that day. We also discussed the importance of memory, the operation of our mind, to remember the good things that God has done for us. This instills within our hearts a godly fear. And it also gives us an empathy for those that are still lost. Last week, if you remember, I said that perhaps loving God with our whole mind is the easiest one for us to relate to among the four. Because prayer is a cognitive exercise. When we pray, we use our minds. We think about the things that we want to petition God for or thank Him for. When we're listening to this sermon, you're using your mind, you're reasoning the words that I'm depositing into your ears by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the essence of preaching itself has caused me to prepare for this text by analyzing the word and praying for it. And so we can relate to loving God with our minds quite easily, but this matter of loving God with our soul, how do you love God with your soul? How do you exercise your free will upon your soul to love God with it? Jesus challenges us in a unique way. He says, love God with all of your soul. Is Jesus indicating that a part of our soul is loving Him and another part not? You know, when I always thought about the soul, I envisioned it as one component part. Perhaps Jesus is saying that it's not that you're parceling a fragment of your soul and loving me with that part, but not the other. Perhaps there's more within your soul, more force behind it, more of an ability to use it to love me. We've all heard the tale of the mother whose child is crushed under a car. And by some supernatural force is able to lift the car to rescue the child. On an ordinary day when not compelled by love, what frail woman could lift a 2,000 pound vehicle? Not one. But when compelled by love, perhaps a force beyond herself, fearing that the child would not perish if she did not exert more of her soul, more of her love into the direction of the child, that there would be no hope for the child's deliverance. Perhaps there's more of a thrust of our will through love behind our soul to love God more. The Bible teaches us that God created man in his image and his likeness. Before we go any further down this path of the soul, have you ever considered that you were made in the image and the likeness of God? What a thought. The image and the likeness of God. You know, sometimes we look in the mirror and we don't like what we see. The reflection is poor. Sometimes when I look in the mirror, depending on the barber I went to the week before, my cowlick just won't stay down, even with heavy gel, and I don't like what I see. I chop it off, but that's not the answer because, you know, when you chop it off, it springs up. You have to let it grow in order for it to lay right. Spiritually speaking, there are things about ourselves that we don't like. Things maybe that we, we've hidden away in our heart in a deep, dark place that only we know about in God, but it's something that omits to us a poor reflection have we ever considered that we were created in the image and likeness of God? What a beautiful thought. As a believer, regardless of what the world 
says about you, the more that you're conformed into the image of Christ, the more that you look like Him, you're beautiful. The more that we love God with our heart, regardless of our human abilities, our mind, our soul, and our strength, we're beautiful to God because we're conveying to Him the image of His beautiful Son, Jesus. Oh, it's good to be made in the image and the likeness of God. But we must not forget that God knows what His image looks like. If He made us in His image and likeness, then what follows is He knows what He looks like. How did God know what He looks like? Is there a mirror large enough to contain the beauty and the image of God? On a clear sky, which we've enjoyed during this last week, could God look into the sky that He created with no clouds and with the, amid the shadow of the beautiful light cast by the sun, see His reflection and mold and shape man in His image and likeness? Did he ask the angels what he looks like? Angels, tell me what I look like. Well, the angels could perhaps tell him what he looked like after they were created, but what about beforehand in the out councils of eternity when God endeavored to create man in his image and likeness? How does God know what he looks like? His perfect beauty and knowledge beyond our comprehension. You see, God knows what he looks like because he's God. And when he was molding and shaping Adam from the clay, and before he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, he was molding and shaping this man with his own hands according to his perfect image as was captured in his own mind with perfect knowledge. Oh, how the world has tried to change the image and likeness of God. God, you should think this way as it pertains to sin. God, you should believe this way as it pertains to this contemporary society. God, you should love this and reject that. God, you should hate this and adorn that. And man, based upon the image of his own sinful, unrighteous self, has been trying to change the image and the likeness of God for generations to no avail. Is this not what the Pharisees and scribes tried to do? When presented with the perfect image and likeness of God through Jesus Christ, they tried to change it. The reflection that He cast upon them made them uncomfortable. They were unable to love God with their whole soul because they did not like what they saw within themselves when they were in the company of Christ. Man being made in the image, in the likeness of God. After he had formed man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And this is the essence of what a soul is. It's the clay that God took forming man the imparting the breath of life. It's the composition of body and the receiving of the Spirit of God that is the soul of man, which was altogether beautiful before man ate of the forbidden tree. Upon eating of this tree, his soul became imperfect because it had one blemish. <coughs> Remember what the scripture said about the lamb that was slain. It was without spot and without blemish. It was perfect. The lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world was perfect. Man, soul became imperfect when he ate of the tree. And only over a, gener a few generations, man became so blemished that God endeavored to destroy the world with a flood. Saving only no one and his family alive in the ark. God used Noah and his family to propagate the earth. And he called forth Israel as a nation. And he endeavored to dwell with Israel as a nation in a perfect way. And so he called them out of Egypt into the wilderness. And what did he do? He abode with man in an ark. 
He took Moses high up into the mountain and he showed him the ark of the the ark of the temple that was to be constructed by Moses perfect according to the image that God gave him in the mount. You can read about this in the Old Testament for yourselves. The dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant were given by God perfect. The way that they were decorated, the artisans, their very names that were to construct the Ark were given to Moses. The way that the inner court was to be fashioned the sheepskins that were to adorn the outside perfect, the inner chamber and the outer court, all of these seven altars perfectly given to Moses to be constructed by Israel in the desert. Why? Was God just being fancy? Was God just coming up with a unique way for Israel to serve Him in the wilderness? The Bible says when the ark in the wilderness was completed, what happened? The Shekinah glory from heaven came down and God abode with man in this tent of skins that Moses and Israel had patterned according to the image and the likeness that God gave Moses in the mount. According to the image and the likeness, God endeavored to dwell with man. And wherever Israel went, if the ark went before them, the power of God went before them, and the enemies of Israel were defeated. If we are to love God with our soul, dear friends, we must fall in love with the image and the likeness of God. The image and the likeness of Christ. As we discussed last week, man is so forgetful. God knowing this, knowing that man forgot about what Adam's soul looked like in the garden. Sent not an image and a likeness, not one made after the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not one made after the Word from which all was created, but He sent the very Word itself. He sent the one that Adam was fashioned after. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, so that the image, of, the image and the likeness of God might be flesh and dwell among man. What did the people see? They saw a sinless, they saw an obedient, they saw a holy vessel of God unto righteousness. One that was preaching for repentance and imparting forgiveness. One that was moving through the multitudes and the Bible says, healing all sorts of manners and diseases. One who heard hungry stomachs. You know, sometimes we don't think about God cares about the intricacies of our life. He hears the growling stomachs. And He multiplied the loaves and the fishes to feed them. Remember when He cast the sea just to heal that demonic who was filled with a legion of angels all chained up whose family and friends had left behind. Oh, dear friend, never doubt the love of God for you. Don't you see the extent to which Christ went to prove how much the Father loves us? We have in the life of Christ the image and the likeness of God who was obedient even to accepting death, death on a cross. And if we are to love God with our whole soul, what is the Word teaching us that we are to do? Is it not teaching us that we are to be imitators of Him? That sounds like such a childish concept, but is that not what God did when He created Adam? Didn't He imitate Himself when He created Adam's arms and his legs? He did. His teeth and his mouth, his ability to speak and to think in his heart, the outward as well as the inward parts, the growing hair and the nostrils that Adam received, the breath, was not God imitating the reflection of His self when He created Adam? And is not the Word of God teaching us if we are to love God with our soul, that we are to be imitators of Christ? 
What would Christ speak today? What would he think today? How would he act today? What would he do in this situation that we find my, that I find myself in? Are we imitators this morning of the Holy One and are we allowing that imitation of Christ to govern our soul? Don't overlook how powerful the words were that Jesus spoke to Pilate, the governor of Rome. He said, you would have no power. You would have no authority over me if it not, was not first given to you from above. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, you're not the governor of my soul. Unless my father permitted me to be handed over to darkness, he would send forth a legion of angels who would deliver me from this place. Now let me take this step one step further. We must not only love the image and the likeness of God through Christ and be imitators of it. Remember when Jesus, after he was crucified and resurrected from the dead, he went into the upper room where his disciples were behind locked doors in fear of the Jews because all that had happened to Jesus in the preceding days. The Bible said that Jesus walked through the doors and he said, Peace be to you. And he showed them his hands and his side and the Bible says they were filled with joy. And then it says that Jesus said a second time, Peace receive ye the Holy Spirit. And he breathed on them. And the Bible says he breathed on them and he sent them. This loving God with our soul has something also to do with this second breath that was imparted to man. This second breath that Jesus breathed on his disciples after he resurrected from the dead. Are we longing for that second breath? Are we longing to be sent by Jesus? If we're longing to be sent by Jesus into the world, into the highways and the byways of life, wherever according to His divine providence wants to send us, then we must first be in love with the image and the likeness of God with our whole soul. Israel struggled with the image of God. The Bible says when Moses went up to receive the law of God, they made a molten calf. How the world nowadays worships gold and money and fame and fortune. These things are in conformity with the image of God. The Holy Spirit nowadays is searching through the earth. He's spanning the whole globe, the Bible says, looking for souls of men whose images are in conformance with the Holy of Holies. He's scanning the globe for people who are in love with God, with their whole soul, that He might breathe on them the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us not only to walk with Christ according to this holy Christian life, but also enables us to be sent by God in a powerful way. Recall the words of the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. When heavens revealed to him the state of the earth, what did he say? He said, here I am, Lord, send me. A Christian that's loving God with their whole soul, when they rise early in the morning, with the dawn of every day, petitions God, here's my soul, Lord, where do you have me to go? Send me into the world. Send me to that sick one. Send me to that lost one. Send me to that hungry one. That one that needs a friend. That one that I saw in the supermarket, supermarket weeping. Send me to that person to bring your love. You see, dear friends, when we're loving God with our whole soul, there's a longing in our soul to be used by God, by the power of His Holy Spirit. Just like the ark of the tabernacle moved through the wilderness and the Shekinah glory came down from heaven to earth, God endeavors to use this 
tent of a body covered with human flesh that's being conformed into the image and the likeness of Christ into a powerful vessel of heaven. One that's filled with the Holy Spirit, the power from on high that moves mobily through the earth, bringing the love of God to the hearts of men. Send me. Send me. Are you loving God with your whole soul? You know, our, we can be loving God with our whole heart. We can love His Word. We can read it and allow it to cleanse us. We can love Him with our mind because our truths are in alignment. Our opinions are in alignment with the life of Christ. But to love Him with our soul means to have a heart of a disciple. One that's longing to be used by God. Longing to be used. Jesus breathed on the disciples in the upper room who were longing to be used by God. And evidence of this fact is after they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they moved throughout the entire world for the rest of their days to the last exhale of their breath, spreading the love of God found only in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you loving God with your whole soul? Well, where has God sent you? Where has He sent you? Recently. Where has He sent you during this last week? Have you petitioned for ascending? Do you love the image of Christ? You know, sometimes we love a certain part of His image, but not others. No, we must love His whole image. The whole life of Christ. Everything that He did, everything that He spoke, the way He combed His hair, the way that He slept and rose and went down in the evening to sleep, the way that He walked into the boat, every last syllable that came forth from His mouth. Oh, I just love the image and the likeness of Christ with all of my soul. And I want that image to be perfected in me. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was the new Adam. He's given us a new image. And if we are to be filled with this second breath, we must be conformed into this new image. This image that's in the mind of God. Jeremiah says, He's the potter and we are the clay. Isn't he doing the exact same thing with us spiritually that he did with Adam when he picked the clay from the ground? He's taking us spiritually and he's conforming us into a perfect image according to a perfect knowledge, according to the perfect example that we receive through Jesus Christ. Being conformed can be painful. Have you ever conformed a lump of clay that lacks water? It's not malleable, is it? You can push and pull it, and you can make some progress with it. You can t make that lump of clay look into a vase somewhat, but if you add water, then the clay becomes somehow malleable. When Jesus breathes on us with the power of the Holy Spirit, it makes us malleable. He breathes on us according to convict us and cleanse us with His Word. He breathes on us that our opinions might come in alignment with the gospel. He breathes on us so that He might conform us into the image of Christ, that He might send us into the world. You know, some people, when they become Christians, they just get so excited about their salvation. They just can't wait to be sent. But it's never wise to send someone with that enthusiasm prematurely because they're just beginning to be conformed in the image in the likeness of Christ. God still has more work to do. You know, sometimes in our enthusiasm, also when a missionary comes and speaks to the church, we say, oh, I want to go. Those are moments in our life when the Holy Spirit's watering us to be sent. But in order to be sent, we must first be conformed into the image of Christ. And love Him with our whole soul. Oh, praise God for the power of His Holy Spirit. 
Are we loving God with our whole soul? Well, who has He sent you to recently? If the Holy Spirit's not sending you, if you're not being used by the ministry of heaven, then you have to ask yourself if you're loving God with your whole soul. If you're loving God with your whole soul, He'll send you. That longing for the living water that flows up from our bellies that cannot be quenched will be satisfied by the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, praise you, Jesus. Let me say one thing pertaining to the soul. Before Adam, nostrils received the breath of life. He was just a lump of clay. A beautiful portrait, perhaps, in the image of God, with arms and legs and feet, but his blood unable to move and his heart unable to beat and his voice unable to speak. But when he received that soul, when he received that breath, excuse me, he became a living soul. Oh, how much we glory in the flesh. When it's inanimate, just like that lump of clay and worthless without the Spirit of God. Dear friend, we must ask ourselves this morning if we are to respond to God's holy word, what is the state of my soul? There's only one of two conditions. It's either dead or it's alive. Adam and Eve sinned and their soul died. How do you bring a soul back to life again? Only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The shed blood of Jesus Christ is what brings the soul back to life again. It's what causes God to look upon sinful flesh and say, this is not an enemy but a friend. You know, one day, every soul will stand before God. Through the exercise of our free will, sometimes we forget about how fleeting time is. It's passing by and by. We, last week, we went to an open house for my oldest child who's going to attend high school in another year. I can remember the day that she was born like it's yesterday. Our lives just flying by. The sooner that our souls fall in love with Jesus, the sooner that we know that our soul has brought, been brought back to life again, we can have a blessed assurance that we belong to God and allow the Holy Spirit to conform us into the image of His Son. One day all souls will stand before God. How will God know the difference between a soul that receives eternal life and the one that receives eternal damnation, will not he just know if the image is in the perfect likeness of his son? The Bible says when Jesus returns, he'll have a garment with blood on it. And those of us that are washed on the blood, the Father will merely look at the blood that you've been washed in and look in the blood that's on his son Jesus and conclude, this is in the image and the likeness of God. This one that was a sinner has been approved through the righteousness of my son who was without spot and blemish. He'll simply look for a reflection of himself who in his mind has perfect knowledge of what he is and who he is. The blood of Jesus Christ brings our soul back to life again. When Adam sinned, he was not righteous, neither was Moses, neither was David, neither was Peter or Paul without the righteousness that we receive through the blood of Jesus Christ. Am I loving God with my whole soul? Well, do you love His image and His likeness? Do you love His life? Do you long for the Holy Spirit? To not only convict you under repentance to be washed, but be, be conformed in the image of Christ. And do you long with every atom of your being to be used by God in a mighty, in a powerful way.
that you might receive this second breath and it might impart unto you the grace that you need to walk this Christian walk with Him. In Jesus' name, amen. We're reminded this morning, Father, of the tent in the wilderness, a hollow vessel overlaid with skins, but made according to very detailed design specifications. The enemies of Israel, when they saw it, could only be befuddled by the peculiar appearance of this tent. Nothing spectacular. And yet full of supernatural power. It moved through the desert with Israel as a sign that God was with them. Dear friend, don't you see the resemblance between that tent and the tent of your body made in the image and the likeness of God with tent poles of bones overlaid with skins, a hollow place filled with the breath of God, a soul meant to carry the power of God as we're conformed into the image and likeness of Christ. The most powerful vessels that God ever used from the beginning of man were the ones that were conformed into His image and His likeness. God is no respecter of persons. But do you love this image of Christ that's been conveyed to you? Or do you find fault in it? Lord, we say no. There is no fault in Christ. He's without spot and blemish, perfect. And we pray now under the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that you might take out of our life anything that comes in the way of our soul being fully in love with you. Any stumbling block of sin, any thought, any bad habit, any fear, any worry, unforgiveness, we surrender it. All to you, Jesus, though he endured the pains of the crucifixion, feared not. He was never afraid. He was never resentful. Never resentful toward his afflictors. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And not resentful towards you right now who are turning in your heart, who didn't know any better who lived the life of ignorance, but have now been brought to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Won't you give your soul to God this morning? By repenting of your sins, He who is able and just to forgive you and wash you in His precious and holy blood. Father, if there be one right now who has never accepted the love of Jesus, we ask that you wash them in your precious and holy blood. Dear friend, won't you ask Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior? The Bible says He'll never leave you and He'll never forsake you, always, even until the end of the world. And then, Lord, as we close, we ask for this second breath of your Spirit to fall afresh upon us, to fill us with your power, to send us to the lost, into our families and into our homes, into those people's lives that need to receive Jesus. And Lord, we just thank you so much for using the ark of our bodies to be used for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and ask all these things. Amen and amen.